So I'm going to repeat the, the 10 points we made at the beginning uh, in terms of a framework for uh, climate change and uh, right to health. Uh, but let's do it in terms of uh, human rights based approaches to climate change. We have talked differently about health imp uh, impacts uh, from climate change where we talked about direct and indirect impacts, uh, climate human activities leading to climate change uh, which leads to air quality and water quality changes as well as susceptibility or vulnerability to vector-borne diseases and uh, others. Um, and we talked about some climate justice communities uh, where uh, human activities which uh, lead to climate change such as coal burning power plants are put in poor neighborhoods uh, it happens even in a great progressive country like ca a state like California in the US so there are in general disparate impacts of climate change for example major uh, majority of the emissions have come from rich countries but uh, impacts have been felt more by the poor countries sea level rise is going to affect uh, island states which have very little to do with historically uh, building up uh, greenhouse gases, right? So here uh, the human rights based approaches is going to use the principles that uh, we talked about uh, which we will already read it once, we will read it again just to conclude the course so that uh, as we go forward there is the whole IPCC activity and Paris negotiations of uh, trying to figure out what will happen in the future and how to uh, do climate adaptation and mitigation and international agreements, nationally determined contributions and so on to keeping climate uh, global warming to less than 2 degrees C with a 66% probability by 2100 uh, and we also said despite all the great negotiations the emissions continue to be on what we call business as usual trajectory which is very discouraging and there are lots of reports that uh, keep pointing out that uh, neither the nationally determined contributions uh, nor the Paris Agreement uh, with the other aspects are on target to meet uh, the 2 degree C warming let alone the 1.5 degree C warming in fact we may go past the 1.5 degree C uh, pretty soon in a decade or two but then there are other details. What, does, what will it mean? Will something dramatic happen when you cross 1.5? Not necessarily. Things are already happening in terms of glacier melt, uh, Arctic ice melt, extreme events, heat waves, health impacts, mortalities, morbidities, uh, labor lost, and so on and so forth, right? Um, so the question then is how to uh, still maintain human rights based approaches to climate change as we continue to battle uh, climate change uh, and move towards mitigating our own impacts. Um, so the principles to go through again identification of the relevant national and international human rights laws, norms and standards so climate change has to be put in the context of uh, some of these things that emerged in the 1940s right after the World War II when uh, the UN uh, got uh, established uh, so now the usual uh, human rights issues, uh, laws, norms and standards uh, or even punishments uh, are now to be uh, considered in the context of climate change. Of course this means attributing responsibility and there are some mechanisms dis discussed for example what is called loss and damage where if a country experiences a cyclone and the cyclone became stronger than expected because of global warming uh, can the additional damage caused by this climate impact on the cyclone be uh, compensated for to the country which suffered could be India could be Philippines could be Bangladesh and so on right complicated but nonetheless mechanisms have to evolve over time or if sea level rise uh, begins to uh, shrink an island how do you compensate that so you know these are still within the uh, international laws norms and standards or they have to be fit into them uh, as new issues evolve the right to health is subject to resource availability but states are obliged to progressively realize the right over time and must identify indicators and benchmarks to measure progress so metrics are needed 
and this is uh, a, a, can be a, a global issue, regional issue, or a national uh, issue. Uh, but again, uh, how to implement these laws and who uh, m monitors the indicators and benchmarks and who assesses progress is not always very clear. But having these stated under the UN uh, Human Rights uh, Framework actually helps the whole process. States have obligations of immediate effect. We talked about critical care uh, immediate uh, care for outbreaks like COVID and so on. Right to health includes freedoms and entitlements, so you have a right to expect um, certain freedoms, um, which I won't give specific examples here because many are kind of controversial. Family planning, for example. Entitlements, uh, so uh, care for elderly people and uh, children, for example. All health services, goods and facilities shall be available, accessible, acceptable and of good quality, referred to as AAAQ. Uh, <coughs> again, um, imposition can be tied, for example, World Bank loan can be tied to ensuring such uh, health systems, right? Um, states have duties to respect, protect and fulfill the right to health. Again, implementation and uh, enforcement are critical. Because of their crucial importance, uh, the right to health analytical frameworks demand uh, that special attention is given to issues of non-discrimination, equality and vulnerability. So there are many cases where the UN tries to raise issues of human rights uh, very uh, regularly every year there is a report uh, whether it's uh, some particular ethnicity or religion being oppressed or uh, constrained restricted whatever you want to call them uh, but how do you take that to uh, right to health how do you uh, make a case for right to health being um, infringed upon in a certain country so that's uh, part of the analytical framework that has to be uh, addressing this, uh, giving it special attention as well. The right to health requires that there is an opportunity for the active and informed uh, participation of individuals and communities in decision making that affects their health. If you are uh, moving a coal burning power plant into a neighborhood or a wastewater treatment uh, plant or uh, nuclear plant and uh, so on or even if you're building a dam for hydroelectric that's going to affect communities and their health then the uh, right to health requires that there is an opportunity for the community to be informed about it and participate in the decision making. Developing countries have a responsibility to seek international assistance and cooperation while resource-rich states have responsibilities to the realization of the right to health in developing countries. Okay? As I mentioned before at the beginning of this chapter, COVID has exposed all the problems with uh, such a situation. Globalization, how diseases spread, um, who may or may not be held responsible for the outbreak, and how the outbreak continues to affect global uh, populations, new variants emerging in one place and making it all around because of travel and uh, immigration and so on. Um, and how poor countries uh, who are devastated by the pandemic can seek help and how rich countries um, must protect these poor countries uh, even for their own protection. Uh, for example, if um, COVID is not made, uh, if people are not made immune to COVID, then nobody is going to be safe. This is true for uh, air pollution. Uh, water quality can be a very uh, uh, regional or local problem. But <coughs> when we talk about um, manufacturing in China, exporting everything, we not only have to worry about embedded carbon uh, and how carbon can be accounted in terms of contribution to pollution and global warming, but also when there is uh, degradation of water quality and air quality in a place that's manufacturing for the world, 
then how do you account for uh, the, the right to health uh, as a global versus local issue okay uh, European Union is taking bold steps to eliminate fossil fuel and it's going to start imposing carbon tax but who gets punished when you impose carbon tax should it be imposed on the people who are manufacturing and producing carbon uh, footprint or people who are buying and consuming so and how do you account for health impacts in this situation as well how does right to health protect uh, people who are manufacturing this can be also mentioned in terms of uh, recycling um, toxic materials uh, from uh, used PCs uh, just a second sorry I have to stop sorry somebody knocked at the door <laughs> this is the state of recording podcasts during the pandemic uh, I'm sitting wherever I am and recording and there is no way to <coughs> find a studio and do it um, without interruption okay so this idea of recycling uh, computer materials extracting uh, uh, precious metals that are in there and so on is good for the environment but the people poor countries who have taken on this sort of recycling pay a heavy price in terms of health so how do you protect uh, those okay so that's where the developing and developed countries and their right to health uh, comes into picture uh, finally to conclude monitoring and accountability mechanisms that are transparent effective and accessible and include redress are crucial so obviously monitoring the right to health and accountability uh, is how do you uh, do this is it that a, a developed world is not meeting its obligation towards developing countries in the context of climate change or is it that a nation state is being discriminatory towards one ethnic group or religious group um, and so on you heard of the vaccine problem uh, in some Middle Eastern countries where one section of the population was not being given vaccination uh, and so on so many levels of uh, monitoring and accountability are needed uh, they have to be transparent effective and accessible it's hard enough to do even within a state or to externally monitor by the UN body let's say uh, into a state and how it's doing in terms of treating its population equally uh, or in terms of holding international obligations accountable so it becomes very critical and international mechanisms for seeking redress are crucial but there is no well-established mechanism right now especially in terms of in the context of climate change impacts on human health and uh, infringement on right to health but these will continue to evolve because the impact of climate change on uh, human health is becoming more and more obvious and accountability for um, climate change impact on human health how to assign uh, uh, responsibility is becoming uh, more and more um, important maybe attribution becomes easier once the process pathways of human activity to climate change to health are uh, clearer right so right now we have looked at many empirical uh, outcomes but the pathways are not always very clear especially non-local ones if air quality over one place is being affected by human activities in another place or if water quality at one coast is being affected by human activity in another country if fish are disappearing or becoming um, less nutritious or poisonous harmful algal bloom is exploding because of activity elsewhere then how do you um, uh, attribute responsibility for the uh, impacts and then how do you impose right to health those are all complicated questions but in the context of planetary health uh, we have to consider those kinds of complicated issues they're not natural science questions so much anymore they are much more political legal and social science questions that's what makes planetary health so important and yet so complicated